So what, what I'd like to do tonight is, is talk a little bit about the case, about, I'll talk about the, the sheriff's case at the end, and before that about uh, the book, and in the middle uh, about the true meaning of gun control. So what the, what the book tries to do, and you can see it's in the, uh, the, the broadside series from Encounter Books, is meant to be in the tradition of uh, Thomas Paine's Common Sense, or the, the, the Federalist by uh, James Madison, Alexander Hamilton, and John Jay, of, of an essay you can sit down and read in, in one sitting, and to be something that, that focuses on the, the core issues. You know, in the gun debate in any given year or given week, there's always a lot of these fiddle-faddle of the day, of whatever the particular incremental controls being pushed by the gun ban lobbies. And those are, of course, worthy issues to talk about. But those are really just placeholders of saying, well, here's our best chance to advance restrictions on people's liberty. This is, uh, so we're going to talk about this issue this month. And then if they can, there's another thing they think they can pass in another month, they're talking about that. And while the debate goes on about those particular issues, subtopics, the the book here, while well, mentioning some of the, the current ones, aims to get to the real core of what the culture war over guns that's been going on for the last 50 years is about, and really what the, the whole gun control issue has been always been about in the United States, and, and indeed uh, in other nations as well. And that is the, the question of sovereignty. The issue that the United States faced in its first gun control debate, which began in 1774, when King George embargoed the import of arms, ammunition, and gunpowder to the United States, is who is sovereign in the United States? Is this a country ruled by we the people, and in which we the people have delegated some of our powers to a federal government to do things that need to be done at the national level, delegated others of our inherent powers to state and local governments, and kept some of the sovereignty reserved for ourselves, uh, including in the fact that the uh, that people own firearms and, and other arms. That's the certainly the original constitutional vision of the United States, and contrary to it is the vision of King George back in the olden days of the modern uh, gun ban movements today, of Michael Bloomberg and, and perhaps of, of the president as well, that the United States should be a more European style society where authority comes not from the people themselves, but rather from the top down, that the government itself is the sovereign rather than merely the delegated agent of the sovereign people. And the sovereign rules the people for their own good. And the wise men in the uh, sovereign government tell the people what to do and make decisions for them, which the people sometimes are not capable of making for themselves. So in England, in, the United, in, in America, one aspect of your sovereignty is you can choose to own a firearm in your home for self-defense. In England, you cannot do that. The sovereign government there has, in essence, decided that would be a bad idea. And people might want to do that, but that would be a mistake. They don't realize their own best self-interest. And so the government will prevent them from making the mistake of owning a firearm for lawful protection. That's the, the same mentality of uh, State Senator Evie Hudak when a the bill to ban licensed carry on public college campuses was before the legislature. Amanda Collins, uh, a woman who at a U Nevada university had been raped because of a similar campus gun ban there, testified and talked about how she was deprived of the ability to protect herself with a firearm. And Senator Hudex said, well, yeah, but the, you know, the odds were against you. It's eight, 83 out of 80 the odds are 83 to 1 that the attacker would have taken the gun and used it against you, which in fact was entirely false. Senator Hudak actually, the, that 83 to 1 statistic is a statistic about something else, which apparently Senator Hudak didn't even understand what, the, what that factoid was about. And then when later she was criticized uh, for that remark, 
she said, well, Senator Hudak, well, I'm, look, I'm, the, you know, I'm the best friend of, of rape victims. I'm looking out for their own best interest. And so that's the view that, in Senator Hudak's view, that you, the government should make the ch choice for the rape victim and say that it's better that she not have a gun because they don't have the uh, ability, these women, to actually use a gun effectively for self-defense. The, the same kind of thing that uh, on Representative, jo Representative uh, Joe Salazar, no relation to the Secretary of State, uh, Interior or, or former U.S. Representative, uh, said that women shouldn't carry guns for self-defense, uh, especially college wom uh, women on, on university campuses, because they might, among other things, they would, ex they would shoot somebody who they just thought was trying to rape them. That, you know, when some guy came up and started strangling them, he might not actually be intending to rape them. It might be he was trying to get their attention because he was bringing them some flowers or he had a telegram. But that, that kind of smug superiority is the core of the gun prohibition movement, the anti-gun movement in this country. It is that Americans are, who want to own guns are ignorant bumpkins and they ought to, they should stop owning so many guns and especially stop owning them for self-defense, which has been the core target of the gun prohibition lobbies all along. There have been some folks in there who are willing to tolerate the existence of guns in private hands for hunting or sport, but in their view, gun ownership for self-defense is inherently disorderly. It's the same view as why uh, England in uh, the early 1950s passed a law which outlawed the carrying of offensive weapons. Now, when you hear a title like that, so, well, yeah, the, you shouldn't carry offensive weapons. Where are you going to go out and commit, do something, uh, perpetrate an offensive act? But what that act actually does is it bans the carrying of defensive weapons. So, for example, under this law in England, if you were carrying a knife, or for that matter, knitting needles, which you, you, you like for, you carry knitting needles because you like to knit, but if you also carried them with the intent that besides that you'll knit when you're bored and waiting in line, that in addition, if somebody attacks you, you would fight back with those knitting needles, that's an offensive weapon under the English law. And as one member of parliament and the government explained when they were passing that law, is well, the idea that people would carry guns or carry any arm uh, with the intent of using it for self-defense in public is an insult to the government because that's a suggesting that the government is not successful at keeping the queen's peace. So to avoid hurting the government's feelings, the, the sovereign government of England prevents people from carrying arms for lawful protection. So that's what the issue is, is about in the United States. It's about, it's what the same issue came up in, in Reconstruction when the former slaves, now the freedmen, wanted to have arms. The southern states reenacted their slave codes and called them black codes and enacted special restrictions on black people having guns. And then America's first gun control organization, the Ku Klux Klan, uh, began carrying out it, its uh, policies by, first of all, confiscating guns from the freedmen, and then only after they'd done that, imposing their domestic, their program of domestic terrorism. Congress reacted with the Freedmen's Bureau Bill, with the Civil Rights Act, and with the 14th Amendment, all of them designed, among, among other things, to ensure that the freedmen would have their Second Amendment rights to use against these domestic terrorists. And again, this was an issue of sovereignty. When you were a slave, well, by definition, you're not a sovereign. You're actually owned by somebody and subject to that person's complete willpower. The purpose of depriving the freedmen of arms was to keep them in de facto slavery, not to be formally slaves under the law, but to be in the same condition of helpless servility, uh, which had existed when, when there was formal slavery. This highlights, the issue of the freedmen highlights one of the important things about the Second Amendment, and it is, is protected by the 14th Amendment, that the uh, gun prohibition movement resolutely uh, will not admit, which is that the issues of sovereignty and of self-defense and of resistance to tyranny 
are all on one continuum. The, for a long time, the uh, gun ban lobbies said, well, once they, their theory that the Second Amendment is just a, st which says the right of the people, is somehow a state's right or a collective right, uh, the, uh, that argument really didn't hold up under any analysis because when you see the phrase, the people, elsewhere in the Bill of Rights, like the right of the people peaceably to assemble, the right of the people to be free from unreasonable searches and seizures, you're of course talking about individual people who have individual rights to exercise. You're not talking about a state's right or some kind of collective right that somehow belongs to everybody at once and therefore thereby belongs to, to nobody. So the gun prohibition lobbies created this new argument of what they called the narrow individual right or the in, indeed the microscopic individual right which was, yes, you have an individual right, but only to have arms for militia purposes. That that's the only thing for which the Second Amendment protects the right to arms. But what they failed to understand in trying this, this small vision of the Second Amendment is that to the founders and to the Americans who preceded them from the, the first days of European settlement, working, serving in the militia and shooting the guy who was breaking into your house to attack your family were not two different things. They were the same, they were the same thing. When you were protecting your family against a guy who was breaking in, or when you were protecting several people against a gang of highway robbers, you were doing the same thing as when you served in the militia and protected your community against a tyrant. Rapists, murderers, bad kings, tyrants are all the same thing. They're exercising unjust and illegal power over another person and doing it by force. And so when you resist, there may be details about how you resist. It might be if, if you're attacked by 20 people, uh, maybe instead of trying to fight back by yourself, it's better off if you have uh, at least a few friends to help you out. And likewise, if you're attacked by a criminal tyrant with his standing army of redcoats, again, that's not something where you fight back personally. You come together with your community in the militia to resist that tyranny. But what you're doing when you are serving in the New Hampshire militia and resisting a tyrant who wants to impose his will on others to deprive them of their sovereignty and to use violence to do so, that is the same thing as what you're doing when in your little farm outside of Concord you're shooting the guy who's breaking in and wants to rape you because the rapist is also a tyrant on a smaller scale. He's also exercising unjust and destroying the sovereignty of the woman over her own body and doing so by force and violence. So to the founding generation, it was all one continuum of, of personal defense and collective defense. Different situations put you in, in, in different ways about how much you need to, to participate in a collective to do that, but you're always doing the same thing, whether you're shooting the rapist or whether you're shooting at the soldiers of uh, a, a, a would-be tyrant. It's always, it's always self-defense and it's always fighting ty tyranny. And so that's the, uh, the key part of the book, and hopefully I didn't give, a, give away too much so you'll still have to buy it and uh, <laughs> read it. So the word gun control has a, is, is now an, an orphan in the world. Back in the olden days when the uh, gun prohibition lobbies in this country really got going and were, were founded, they, and were overtly in favor of banning and confiscating handguns, they, they characterized themselves as engaged in gun control. So, for example, there was an organization called the National Council to Control Handguns, and they worked hard in support 
of uh, a referendum in Massachusetts uh, to confiscate all handguns in the state in 1976. That referendum was defeated in a landslide with 68% of the people voting against it, and the, the key to that landslide defeat was the near unanimous opposition of law enforcement uh, throughout the state of Massachusetts. And so later that group changed its name to Handgun Control Incorporated. And they were still uh, in favor of banning lots of things. Now they said, oh, we don't want to ban handguns, we just want to control them. But oh, we do want to ban assault weapons, which we will define as the broadest set of arms that can possibly be banned under any given set of political circumstances. And they even, they even banned some air guns in New Jersey with their assault weapon law. But as they had their political setbacks and failed to exploit Columbine with the success that they had hoped and cost Al Gore the 2000 election, the group fell on hard times and decided we need to, to change our names. So instead, and they also, with their polling and their focus groups, they'd realized, you know, Americans don't like control. That, that's a grading kind of words. So even before they formally changed their name, they described themselves as being about gun safety. That, that's what they were for. They were, they were gun safety advocates. And of course, uh, they were rather late to the game because the oldest civil rights organization in the United States also happens to be the oldest gun safety organization in the United States, and that's the National Rifle Association, which is founded in 1871 and has been teaching Americans how to be safe and responsible with firearms ever since then. So the uh, handgun control changed its name to the Brady Campaign because it, its spokespersons were people who were certainly in the, the 70s and 80s and 90s been very popular and influential in Washington. President Reagan's former press secretary, James Brady, who was very gravely wounded by John Hinckley's attempted assassination attempt, and his, his wife, Sarah Brady. And so the, the gun ban lobbies rode the, tried to use the gun safety thing for a while, and ultimately ended up not getting very far with it. So now the new focus-tested phrase is they are about gun violence uh, prevention, which is a, you know, something that everybody can agree with, uh, although really in practice what they mean by gun violence prevention is not only preventing criminal gun violence, it's also preventing gun violence that's being used against the criminals. So for example, that, that's why what Senator Evie Hudak and Representative Joe Salazar were talking about is no, we don't want the rape victims, potential rape victims, to engage in gun violence, they could have said. And it's reflected in the Colorado laws, uh, bills, uh, signed by Governor Hickenlooper. So for example, just to jump ahead a second, the magazine ban, which goes into effect on July 1st, if you have a magazine that's over 15 rounds, it's grandfathered if you are in, uh, if you're the ownership of it of July 1st. So if you've got your, say, your Glock pistol and a 17 round magazine, that it's lawful for you to have that. But for it to stay, you to stay lawful, you not only have to keep the ownership, so you, you can't sell it. That, that's a very straightforward and easy to understand thing in terms of what it means legally. It also means an additional separate requirement is you have to keep continuous possession. And so what that means is you go out of town for a business trip for three days. You can hand your Glock pistol to your wife to say, here, use this for self-defense if, if somebody attacks you. That's okay to do. But you can't give her the 17-round magazine. So you can't give her the component, accessory, of the gun, which is essential to the gun's function. That would be a violation of continuous possession. And that's not some extreme interpretation. That is exactly what the bill says and means. And in fact, the day before Governor Hickenlooper signed it, his office called me up and I talked with on the phone with some folks in his office, including uh, his chief legal counsel. And we were in complete agreement that the scenario I just described is exactly how the law operates. That's what it means. And so 
I guess that's another form of gun violence prevention because it means that when the wife is out of town and a pair of gangsters break in, that will reduce the chance that she would perpetrate gun violence against them. But left behind, of course, is the phrase gun control, which the people who were originally for it uh, now you know, uh, treat like some, uh, some friend, old friend who's fallen on hard times. They pretend they don't know him and they never, never met him. So I think it's time to understand genuine gun control and to understand that proper constitutional gun control is not something which is the opposite of gun rights, but rather it is a complement to it and helps gun and works to, should, when done properly, work together with gun rights and as they both synergistically uh, help public safety. Let me give you an example of, of some legitimate gun control laws. As you know, we, we work at the Independence Institute very with, with the sheriffs. Uh, I, I wrote the amicus brief on behalf of county sheriffs of Colorado in the Supreme Court of Colorado in the case where the Colorado Supreme Court ruled unanimously that the University of Colorado is not entitled to an implicit exemption from Colorado's concealed uh, carry act that they have to follow the same rules just as, as every other uh, government entity um, and allow licensed carry uh, on their property. When the Concealed Carry Act was going through the legislature in 2003, it was written by the sheriffs. There were lots of groups that were for it, but it was the sheriffs who were in charge of the content of the law and were the strongest proponents of it. And they based their they based the Concealed Carry Act on the successful uh, carry permitting policy of uh, Sheriff, uh, then Sheriff Jim Alderton, uh, up in northern Colorado. One of the things the sheriffs insisted on was that besides the you get your 10-point fingerprints taken and those get checked by the Colorado Bureau of Investigation and the FBI, you have to show proof that you passed a safety training class. And in addition, they said we have to have what is informally called the naked man rule. And that is that a sheriff can deny a permit who's passed the background check, had the safety training class, but the sheriff can still deny the permit if the applicant, if in the sheriff's view, the applicant would be a danger to himself or others if granted the permit. Now, if the sheriff does that, the applicant is entitled to an appeal, and the burden of proof in that case is on the sheriff. But this is an important safety valve, and the reason it's called the, the naked man rule is uh, you have the guy who uh, sits naked in his lawn chair uh, in the front, in the front of his house all day, uh, yelling about the impending Martian invasion. He may have a perfectly clean criminal record and may have the intelligence to pass a, a safety training class, but he shouldn't be carrying a gun. And the the naked man rule gives the sheriff the discre a proper discretion in that case. There were claims that oh, the sheriffs are just going to abuse it, and they, you know they'll never issue permits to anybody because they'll just say everybody nobody's everybody's a danger to himself and others. But they haven't. They've used it appropriately and in a limited way with a, a good use of their discretion. So that's an example of a uh, reasonable gun control law that helps enhance public safety and you can say in a way perfects the exercise of the Second Amendment right because it's one of the things that helps make it more likely that the people who are carrying guns are the ones who should be carrying guns. A good gun policy aims to increase the number of guns in the hands of people who should have them and to decrease the number of guns in the hands of people who should not. Another example of how gun control done right enhances the right to arms is in the one good gun-related bill the legislature passed this year, which I testified for, by Senator Lois Tockrop, who was one of the original uh, Adams County Democrat uh, very strongly pro-gun, you know, classic, more of the old, old-fashioned what the Democratic Party used to be before it got taken over uh, um, by the uh, progressive uh, academic establishment. Uh, ver she's very pro-gun, pro-union, pro-working man. And so her bill said that on the mandatory safety training class you take for your concealed carry permit in Colorado, at least some of the instruction 
has to be done in person. It can't be done entirely online. And that's because this sleazy guy had set up this one hour course, uh, you know, where you just like watch a video for one hour. And of course, there's no way to tell if you even watch the video, no test afterward of your knowledge. And that's not the kind of fair pro-safety training uh, that the author, that the Concealed Carry Act envisioned or that the sheriffs had supported in the first place. So this provision to say you have to do some of the training in person still allows for all the, the great new electronic developments that have come in about like electronic shoot, shooting simulators and supplemental training on the internet and all kinds of good things where you, you can have distance learning and the delivery of information and, and training uh, via computers and other electronic media. But at the same time, there should be that foundation of having part of the class be in person. And again, that's something that perfects the exercise of the right rather than impeding it. Uh, and an example of how gun control laws can be reasonable, can work properly, and can, when done right, enhance gun rights uh, rather than, than infringe them. But in contrast, the other gun laws uh, passed by the legislature and signed by the governor do directly uh, frustrate uh, and impair Second Amendment rights, in especially including the right of self-defense. And so as many of you have heard, later this month, 52 of Colorado's elected sheriffs will be filing a civil rights lawsuit against the new, new anti-gun laws. Uh, I will be representing the sheriffs. There are going to be other parties in the case with other attorneys. Uh, for example, the Colorado Out Outfitters Association, uh, which is the, the pro professional association of Colorado's uh, hunting guides, the Colorado State Shooting Association, Outdoor Buddies, which is one of the, the nation's leading organizations uh, for disabled shooters. Uh, so we will be presenting lots of information about how the laws are not only unconstitutional in a purely legal argument sense, but also really directly showing how harmful these laws are to public safety and how harmful they are to law enforcement, both because these laws are unenforceable in themselves, because these laws make things more dangerous by making it harder for law-abiding citizens to be able to protect themselves, and by because these laws are poisonous to effective law enforcement. One of the things the sheriffs truly believe is that effective law enforcement in a free society is dependent on the cooperation of the public. It's the public, it's, you know, if you see something, say something. It's the public that has to be the witnesses, that has to make the phone call when they see uh, a, a potentially dangerous situation developing. It's the public that has to come forward and help the sheriffs on so many levels that makes law enforcement possible, really. And because if you have to do it the way it's done in Syria, for example, uh, where it's purely an imposition from above and nobody expects the police to ever be your, or the sh to be your friends, uh, then you don't get much cooperation from the public and it's a lot easier for crime to, to thrive uh, with, no, with no public support for law enforcement. And so these anti-gun laws have the effect of making people afraid of law enforcement. Am I violating something? Oh, you know, boy, I've got a 16-round magazine in my car uh, which is grandfathered, but oh yeah, you know, I, I wasn't in continuous possession because I let my friend borrow it last week to go shooting, and so oh, I mean, it's a kind of a sketchy situation I see on the corner. But I better not call 911. I better not get involved because I'm I'm in a sketchy situation myself legally now, and so that that's one of the many ways in which these new anti-gun bills gravely endanger public safety. So soon, your 52 elected sheriffs are going to be stepping forward and standing up for constitutional rights, for law enforcement, and for public safety. And we are hopeful uh, that the court will vindicate that. Thank you. So let's, let's do some, yes, sir.
the general, uh, it's a different thing because when you're getting the concealed, and of course, one of the things the naked man didn't really think through is if he's naked, carrying the concealed weapon is going to be really tough anyway. <laughs> yeah. I think that the home and public are, are different situations, and obviously when you're in public, you're coming into contact with a large number of people and of strangers in a variety of situations. So some guy, our, our naked man who's on the edge, hypothetically, you know, he's, he's, he's not violently mentally ill that you, you could put him in an institution, but he's, he ain't perfectly mentally healthy either. Uh, it's possible that guy might not be a danger at home with a gun, but in, in public, the, the variety of the situations, the sheriffs would have to prove the case about why he, he would be a danger to himself and others in public. Yes, yeah. Well, no. His car, the car is important, but it's not, it is not in the law an extension of your home. And uh, believe me, when you, you see the, the search and seizure laws that apply to cars, uh, compared to the ones that apply to your home, uh, very, very different. The home gets much stronger protection uh, on, on searches and seizures. It's, it's in, yeah, I understand it, it is sort of a little abode that you're in for a while and, you know, like your home, you can have your stereo, your, you know, all, all your sodas and things like that and have a comfortable environment, but in, in law it is not your, it is not an extension of your home. That, that is something that varies state by state. In Colorado, that is generally true uh, if you're carrying it for self-defense. Uh, a handgun, not a, not a long gun for self-defense. But there's also a lot of interference with that uh, by Denver and, and Aurora. Yes, way in the back. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. The answer is, is only in a limited way. I mean, that's, you know, you, you can, people, can, I wouldn't, I think calling it a binding precedent that other courts are going to feel compelled to follow is uh, optimistic, but, it, but it, it still has some good language in there. No, that, I think that's a, that, that is a serious concern. Um, the, uh, now, on the, on the universal background checks, so-called bill, that's taken care of because you can, whether you're teaching at a gun range, there's an exception for that if it's a gun incorporated range, but anything, any transfer you do of a gun when you're in the continuous presence of the transferee, that's okay. The problem, the problem is with the magazines and yeah, and that, that's certainly one of the things we're going to be bringing forward is that obviously when the, the range safety officer or the, the, the NRA certified instructor, which I am as well, holds someone's gun, that's okay, but then the, you have the magazine that goes with the gun, that's an interruption of the continuous possession, so you're now both criminals. You know, the governor has said, well, I'm going to, I'll have the attorney general and the Department of Public Safety write guidance on this, but there's two problems with that. One is guidance isn't legally binding. So he can write all the guidance he wants, and maybe the Colorado State Highway Patrol will be nice and follow that, which would be great. But he can't tell the Denver Police Department or the Broomfield Police Department or anybody else how they have to enforce the law. The law is what the law is. It's, it's the words of the statute. And really, by doing that, he's, he's essentially admitting that th this guidance is basically going to be saying, uh, how about we actually don't enforce what the law says, and we enforce instead a milder and more moderate thing that would have been written if the legislature uh, had paid attention, for example, to the sheriffs uh, who testified 
unanimously against the law. It's important to note, by the way, that we're the, the, the very large majority of Colorado's sheriffs are going to be joining the lawsuit. There are some who have decided not to join in, and of course they, they don't have to. They, 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 can, they can all have their reasons of their own. But for all of them who are not, the, that group who is not joining, I want to make it very clear that the reason they've decided not to join cannot possibly be because they are anti-gun. All 62 of Colorado's elected sheriffs unanimously working through their association, County Sheriffs of Colorado, issued a position paper to the legislature in January of this year, unanimously, all 62, saying these gun pro anti-gun proposals are unconstitutional and they are dangerous and they are unenforceable. And that was the position that all 62 of the sheriffs took and a huge number of them went down to the Capitol uh, to speak and stand and testify against them. So the fact that, say, a few of them will not be taking that additional step of filing a lawsuit. That, that's their choice. It certainly shouldn't be taken as any implication uh, that there are the, the, the ones who are not in the lawsuit are in any way opposed to Second Amendment rights. We're not, uh, and don't take action to defend it because they all did in the legislature this year. Yes, ma'am. We will. The question was what, what venue for the lawsuit. Uh, we will reveal that when it happens, but I can tell you uh, it will have to be in Denver because if you are suing over a statewide law, you gotta be suing in Denver if you're in state. It's gotta be in Denver State District Court if you're in, in the, the state courts. And if you're suing in federal courts, there is only one federal court in the state of Colorado and, that, and that's in Denver. One of the effects of the fact that Bob Dole was the senator from Kansas rather than Colorado is Kansas has three divisions within its federal judicial district. Colorado only doesn't have any divisions. There's, you want to go to federal court, go to Denver. Yes, sir. Well, you, you, so can you escape the background check on private sales? Yeah. Can you get in a car, drive up the sign in, or the first exit in Wyoming, make the transfer, and drive back, and not be subject to... I actually, I haven't, I haven't thought about the answer to that question, but in, in general, interstate gun sales by people who are not federally licensed firearms dealers are, as a general matter, prohibited. So you can't... You can't sell your gun to a person in Wyoming. You, you'd have to do that transaction. Right? And then going outside the state to do it, I would not. Um, having not thought it through, I wouldn't. I wouldn't advise that. Yeah. Yeah. We are uh, going to say that the private sales restriction in the, that first of all, that to the extent it applies to actual mere transfers, uh, you know, that people on a family farm have a gun that they share and, and use for that purposes. And under the bill, so that let's say the, the family farm is mom and dad and five other relatives and three farmhands, by the House Bill 1224, the background, 1229, the background checks bill, and that family farm is a corporation, as most of them are these days, that when that corporation buys a gun, you actually have to do a background check on every single person who that corporation is going to allow to use the gun. So you've got to do now at $10, assuming you'll find somebody who'll do it, $10 per individual, $10 fee to the farm, the gun store, $12 fee to the Colorado Bureau of Investigation, you got to pay that $22 times all the family members and all the farmhands for the acquisition of that single firearm. So we're going to say that is unconstitutional. We are not taking a position on one way or the other on whether background checks can be required for private sales as a theoretical matter, but we are saying is this one among the, among the reasons why it's unconstitutional even for actual private sales, not just 
temporary loans and things like that, is that it's not going to be functional. You have to go to a federal firearms licensee to do the transfer, a licensed gun dealer. Well, the vast majority of them are uh, small home-based businesses. They may not be interested in having some stranger show up at their door and do a gun transaction for them. And for the storefronts, the, the stores, their maximum fee they can charge according to this law, and they have no obligation to do the checks, is $10. Well, that, that's not much money for the completion of a two-page federal paperwork form uh, at which it is the gun dealer is in extreme legal peril if something in that form is wrong. Uh, the time it takes waiting on the phone or the, the computer to do the background check, it's often hours, sometimes days. Uh, I think it'll be difficult in practice for people who want to comply with this law to find federally fi licensed firearms dealers to, to carry it out for them. And so for that reason, a law that people can't comply with in practice is a due process violation under the 14th Amendment. Yes, sir. The um, statute says basically that the if you're arrested for the mag the, the stage at which you get to say, oh, the 16 round magazine that's in my Sig Sauer pistol, I've had this since since 2010. The stage at which you get to do that is at your criminal trial, <laughs> and and at your and at your criminal trial you get to testify and you can say, oh, I got this magazine in 2010, and then it's the burden is on the government to disprove uh, your argument. But it is, it is the criminal trial stage uh, where that defense is raised. Yes, sir. Well, why, why were they pushed through despite their evident problems when among, and were we a national test case, and why, why didn't they make the language in the bills better and less vulnerable to legal challenge? Well, I, I testified uh, before the Senate Judiciary Committee, and I, I told him how to write a constitutional magazine ban, or at least one that would be a lot harder to challenge uh, constitutionally. Um, and it, it certainly wouldn't have had a set the limit at, at 15. Um, and they didn't, uh, not surprisingly, they didn't listen to me. And, but I said, you know, if I, can tell you, if I can tell you how to write a constitutional law instead of an unconstitutional one, I'm going to tell you how to do that. This Colorado push came from the White House with Michael Bloomberg as its operative. It was, it's the Bloomberg lobby, the lobbyists for gun control in this state. Not, sorry, not for gun control, for gun bans in this state, uh, magazine bans and which in effect turns into a firearms ban if you can't have the functional component for your firearm. They were all Bloomberg, it was the Bloomberg lobby doing what the White House said and the reason these bills ultimately passed, the, the magazine bill passed the House and the Senate was because the White House called. You know, if you're a Democratic state representative or a state senator and the vice president of the United States of your party gets on the phone and says we really need you on this, th that happens maybe once in your lifetime. And that's what put these bills over the top. I think as the process went on, how bad the language was in the bills became clearer and clearer. But they were by that point at a stage where if you try to fix them and you give the, ch the House of Representatives an opportunity to vote on it a second time, there was enough buyer's remorse that nothing might have made, the no, the no magazine ban, however corrected, uh, could have passed. Yes, sir. Yeah, you. Um, at the Cato Institute, the 
rule is that Cato has lots of scholars, and the scholars speak for themselves. There is no official Cato position on things. So Bob Lovey can say what he thinks, and I usually agree with him, and I can say what I think as a Cato guy, and this happens to be one of the issues uh, we disagree on. I, I think the Mansion Toomey bill, as I wrote in National Review Online and on, on Volokh.com, was partly because it was drafted so hastily, was seriously miswritten, and some of the provisions which were intended to enhance uh, protection of Second Amendment rights actually would have weakened those protections. Yes, sir. The first stage in, in a lawsuit is filing a complaint. That's the you know initiation. That's sort of like the in the military. That's like we we hereby we send you a note saying we hereby declare war. Uh, so we'll a war of the, war of words. Um, that's what starts a case. It, it is a separate decision about whether to ask for a preliminary injunction, which is an injunction that a judge orders before the case is even o over. But I'll tell you when, you, when you ask for a preliminary injunction, that you're asking, judge, how about you make the decision now, and then you hear all the evidence afterwards. Uh, you carry a very high burden in trying to do that. And the judge, by the rules of procedure, must say every disputed fact in this case, I must assume in favor of the other party. So if A sues B and then A asks for a preliminary injunction, the judge, when he's ruling on that motion for the preliminary injunction, has to assume every possible fact in B's favor. And so the case has to be so strong that if every fact is the way B says it is, A still ought to win that as a matter of law. That is a uh, difficult burden to carry, and we are uh, we are considering what to do on that. Uh, but you, you should know it's not moving for preliminary injunction is not something you do lightly. The courts are more well, well and it, typically the result at the end of the trial is if. Now the judge has heard all the evidence on both sides and doesn't have to make any assumptions. He knows what the facts are, and he's, he's heard both sides' arguments about the facts, and he's made up his own mind about the true state of the facts. And then if the judge finds a law to be unconstitutional in that factual setting, then what she will do at the end of the case is issue an injunction, which is an, an order uh, against the enforcement of that, whatever part of the law was found to be unconstitutional. Sure. Yes. Yes. Absolutely. And that, that's true on a preliminary injunction, by the way. We're looking at the Supreme Court on this issue. Not necessarily, no. Yes, sir. M Mr. Armstrong. Yes. It would seem to be lawful, as long as they stay in continuous possession. So... Make when you're when you're when you're driving here from Iowa, keep the magazines in your car. Don't put them. Don't let them be in the moving truck, separate from you when they enter the state of Colorado. One more question. Somebody hasn't asked a question before. Yes, sir. The country would certainly be safer if legislators enacted laws more based on the guidance of responsible gun safety organizations, such as the National, Sh the National Rifle Association, or for that matter, uh, the county sheriffs of Colorado. <laughs>